Welcome, City Church Chicago, uh, to our Sunday service today. Um, we are going to be presenting uh, the message portion of our service a little bit differently today. We have Karen Freeman Wilson, uh, who's with us today, and we're going to be having a conversation um, uh, about faith uh, and race today. Um, and we're so privileged to have her here. Uh, she is currently the president and CEO of the Urban League here in Chicago. Uh, Karen, thank you for taking time today to be with City Church Chicago. Thank you, Pastor Kim, for having me. It's an honor to be here. Can you share a little bit about um, the Urban League and the work that they do? So for over 100 years, the Chicago Urban League has been fighting for social justice, economic empowerment, and educational achievement uh, for black communities for the black community and black families. It has been located on the south side, even though we serve all of Chicago, and we do that through our programming. We have a research and policy department. We have an educational department that works with young people. We have um, a center for entrepreneurship that focuses largely on micro businesses. And then we also have a housing and financial empowerment department and workforce development. And probably workforce is the department that is known best in the community. And we do things um, as large as solar panel, uh, training people to install solar, solar panels. And then of course we have some of the larger employers, Amazon and UPS who are always looking for people. That's amazing. What would you say you're most excited about currently um, with the Urban League? Well, you know, um, and the one department I forgot is probably the, uh, the department that gives me uh, the greatest pride, and that's our uh, fellowship, our Impact Fellows Program. We're about to start our eighth class, the class of 2021, and that's exciting. But I think the thing that excites me generally about the Urban League is the uh, leadership that we have provided and that we have the opportunity to provide in the racial equity, racial justice space. I'm really excited to talk more about that today in our conversation. But, um, but before we go there, I, wanna, I want you to share a little bit about your history, because as a leader, um, you are quite accomplished. And I think it's important for our community just to, to know a little bit more about you. So um, uh, you were the mayor of Gary, Indiana. Is that correct? I was. I served as the mayor of Gary for eight years from 2012 until most recently 2019. Uh, Gary is my hometown, so it was an honor and, and very humbling to serve as the mayor of my uh, hometown. I had previously served as a judge in the city of Gary, as well as uh, the attorney general for the state of Indiana. In fact, um, I, uh, at, up until recently, referred to myself as a professional vagabond and, um, and also promoted and continue to promote drug treatment courts because um, I served as the executive director of a nonprofit in, in Washington, D.C. So let me ask you this question. Growing up in Gary, you said you were from Gary. Yes. Did you um, see yourself as a leader, and did you ever dream that you would be um, a ma the mayor of Gary, Indiana? So I had a unique opportunity growing up, and that was to meet and spend time with the first black mayor of Gary, and that was Richard Gordon Hatcher. And I met him when I was seven. So when I met him and I heard him talk about um, the things that he wanted to do and accomplish in the city when he was a candidate, I knew immediately that I wanted to be a mayor. Uh, and it was really odd because here I am, this seven-year-old little girl listening to a man talk about serving as mayor. But it was something because I was an only child or at least raised as an only child and always in adult spaces that didn't seem out of the ordinary to me. So I knew that. Um, I didn't know uh, about the leadership aspect of it and how much responsibility you have 
as a leader because, you know, of course I was seven. But I understood what it meant to serve because my mother had always taught me about the importance of being of service to your community. And so I was focused on the service uh, more than the leadership. I love that. And I love that you, you shared um, about meeting the mayor. Yes. You know, I, I believe that as a leader, um, seeing others lead um, and being introduced uh, to leadership personally is so key um, for us to have vision you know, of our own. Sure. And um, I remember um, meeting heroes of mine that before I wanted to do what they did, I was interested in who they were. And, and so you mentioned your mother. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, the role that your mother played in your life and influencing you? So my mother um, was a tremendous influence on me as a, a child and continues to influence me today. She's still living. In fact, both of my parents uh, were influential, but my mother was all about service. Uh, she was a, a secretary in the office, local office of the NAACP, when I was a little girl. And because I was an only child, I generally would go with her to work. So I would hear people talk about protesting, and I would hear uh, folks talk about um, in making sure that we were able to secure our voting rights and the other rights that were important to us as black people. Um, I also understood that you always had to treat people the way that you wanted to be treated. I got that from my mom. Uh, I got my sense of hospitality, my sense of humor from my dad and, and the um, sense of excellence from my dad. You know, I can remember in seventh grade bringing uh, four A's and two B's home, and my dad said, that's good, but we want to see straight A's. And so from then on, that was my goal and that, because that was what he understood to be, one, achievable, and two, important. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I think it's important. You know, I know that you're a humble leader, so you're not going to brag, but tell, tell us a little bit about your education. So I um, went to Roosevelt High School, and, you know, um, it's bittersweet because we just graduated our last class, uh, Roosevelt Close, but there are many Roosevelt graduates throughout the world. And um, after graduating from Roosevelt, I went to Harvard College in Cambridge and Harvard Law School, and it was a, a tremendous blessing to go wow. there, but it was culture shock, going from Gary to Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, was really an experience. But it was an experience that I was able to embrace and one, I think, that made me even more committed to coming back and serving my community. I love that. And first of all, that, that's, that's a big deal. I grew up in Northwest Indiana, and I can tell you there's not new, too many people I knew in Northwest Indiana that, that made it to Harvard University. That's such uh, an accomplishment. So really, throughout your life, you know, you can see, right, with your family, and even, you know, um, you have this DNA of leadership uh, in serving. Um, how much did your faith uh, play a part in that? I, it has played a tremendous role. I, I have been blessed beyond measure. And, um, you know, my dad was a golfer, and so he didn't quite make it to church on Sundays because he worked during the week and golfed all weekend. But my mom actually taught Sunday school for 30 years. And so oh, wow. we went to Sunday school and church. And so very early on, she impressed upon me the importance of, of just understanding who God was. But it really wasn't until I got to college when I was really, really homesick and knew that I had to finish what I had started, so it wasn't, you know, okay, now you can leave, uh, that my faith became really personal to me. You know, it wasn't a ritual. It wasn't, you know, you go to church every Sunday. It was the need to have a relationship because, you know, I was in a different uh, 
area, a different place with different people that I had to grow to learn and understand. And so my faith became an anchor for me and has remained that to this day. And so um, when I see adversity, uh, my faith is the first thing that I lean on. Uh, when I see triumph or when I am uh, successful, my faith is the first thing that I acknowledge in that. And um, it, it, you know, it has served me well. Well, I just want to say that we're so honored to have you here. And for me personally, um, we're living in a time where there um, is, I would say, um, you know, an overwhelming amount of racial tension recently. But this racial tension, you know, that is being felt by so many um, across our nation is nothing new uh, to so many of our black and African-American brothers and sisters. Can you share a little bit about uh, where you feel like we are at right now um, as a country in dealing uh, with um, racism? That is a tremendous uh, question and, and so important. And so we are in the midst of a pandemic. And it is a pandemic that we have seen uh, really impact uh, different communities in different ways. And in the black and brown community, we have seen a much higher illness and death rate, particularly here in Chicago, that has been troubling. And so you go from trying to not just survive, but transform out of this pandemic, and then you see um, a man who was murdered on video, uh, George Floyd, in Minneapolis. And, and I remember learning about uh, what happened, what was done to George Floyd. And I remember being so uh, baffled and really even heartbroken because I said, this has happened again. It happened before with Eric Garner. And so I, somehow in my mind, I thought, well, that will never happen on video again. And of course, we saw George Floyd, and then um, that happened after having seen uh, Ahmaud, Ahmaud Arbery and having learned about Breonna Taylor. And I think that coupled with COVID was just too much for uh, a community who had experienced the vestiges of 400 years of, of subjugation, of, of just being objectified not, and treated less than human. It was just too much to take. And I think what's happening at this point in time is that it's not just black folks who are saying, this is just enough but it's our white and Latino and Asian brothers and sisters who are saying, you know, this is just unacceptable for a nation that has as much wealth, as much opportunity, as much everything as we have to have a class of citizens who have so little. And that is from a race standpoint, but it's also from a poverty standpoint as you look at our brothers and sisters who live in poverty. And so I think we've now determined as a collective, at least those of us who understand we can and should do better, that we, have, we owe our black brothers and sisters, our Latino brothers and sisters, we owe our poor brothers and sisters more, and, and we have to do better. Yeah, when I hear you talk about COVID disproportionately affecting, you know, uh, the black community, sure. and I hear you um, share what we all have experienced, you know, in viewing what happened to George Floyd, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, mindful of, you know, this reality of systematic racism. Sure. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I think uh, in fairness, um, you know, white people and, and white, the white community, I don't know um, if they really understand, you know, what that means. They don't really know how to identify it. But those are two perfect examples 
um, that, that you pointed out, but can you share a little bit? I mean, as, as a mayor, you know, as a civil rights leader, a leader uh, in our uh, community, uh, how, how do you explain uh, systematic racism? How would you define it? How, do, how, do, how would you um, uh, introduce it to someone maybe who doesn't understand it or has never been explained before? You know, um, and, and it's interesting that you would say that a lot of people don't understand it. And it's easy not to understand because you're not raised learning about our history, right? So you don't learn about slavery. You don't learn about the Jim Crow laws or the discrimination laws, or you don't learn about lynching. And all of those things in our history create uh, what you have referred to and what we all refer to as institutional or systemic racism. The fact that for a long time it was legislated that we would be educated separately and that as a result of those separate educations, uh, black children were had substandard educations, not because they weren't smart or not because their teachers weren't smart, but because you had substandard material. You didn't have the books or the technology or the, um, the equipment that your white counterparts had in their communities. And that's something that we've seen continue to this day. When we think about systemic racism, you think about the fact that as a rule, some people, if they know that someone is black, maybe they see it in their name or in their extracurricular activities or in the schools that they may have gone to or where they live, they will make that assumption and immediately throw that resume away. You don't interview that person, you don't find out what they're about, and they may be just as qualified or even more qualified, but there is a system in place that will say that I'm not going to open this opportunity up to a black person, or even in boardrooms in America where you know that um, sitting on a board gives you an, a special privilege, a special opportunity. It also allows you to create other opportunities or opportunities for other people. But, you know, because the board chooses who sits on the board and the CEO chooses who sits on the board, you don't have that opportunity. So there is a system. And so the way that I always describe it in shorthand, you know, because I'm a card player. I like to play bid whist. <laughs> and, you know, you have this deck of cards that are already stacked and before your hand is dealt. And so if you're born in this country, you are subjected in many instances, if you're black, to many disparities there are health disparities, there are educational disparities, there are disparities around housing and employment and the access to capital that you get. And unless your parents have worked extremely hard or who have gained access like I've been blessed to do and, and like so many of my colleagues have been blessed to do, then you're going to have the impact of those disadvantages that will impact you and your children, and it happens for generations. And that's why you see this huge divide in our city, in our country, and, and they call it the racial wealth gap. You know, as we're having this conversation today, I'm mindful of those in our faith community that, um, you know, are beginning this conversation, some for the very first time. Um, I'm also mindful of um, those in our community that might feel exhausted, you know, by the conversation. For someone who is at the forefront, really, of leading, you know, in this arena, what are some, um, you know, what are some ideas or some thoughts that you could give maybe to some of our uh, white people when it comes to just being sensitive or just being aware when we do have these conversations? 
Well, I, I think that it's important that there is a desire to have these conversations. And, and you're right. Sometimes it can be exhausting as a black person, as a black woman, to have to um, bring up things that you know won't be brought up unless people, uh, unless you bring it up. You know, things about race or things about, um, you know, how do we open up opportunities for other people. But I think it's important to have the conversation. And, and the fact that white folks want to have that conversation, I think is important. I think they want, uh, they should feel comfortable and they shouldn't feel like, well, I don't know, I don't want to ask a stupid question. Or, I don't want to say anything that'll be offensive. Because uh, if church isn't a safe space, for us to engage, then I don't know what place he is, right? And so it's important for us to engage in church. It's important to engage in our community meetings. And increasingly, what we're finding is that on our jobs, folks are really creating a space for us to be uh, honest and to ask those questions. But I think also reading is important. There have been some tremendous publications. Uh, last year, there was the 1619 Project that was produced by the New York Times that um, talked about the 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow and other laws that have had an impact on blacks in America. And so that's a great read. Uh, reading some of the things by the famous Chicagoan, Ida B. Wales mm -hmm. uh, is extremely helpful and, and important. So there's reading that people can do that would help to enlighten them. And there, there's reading that we can all do together that would then set the backdrop for conversations um, that we can all have and, and ha ask the questions that may be hard but are important for us to ask in, at this time. Yeah. You know, for, in Luke 2.52, Jesus uh, grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with men. And we see this when Jesus is 12. And not much is mentioned after that period. And so we could assume that from the period of Jesus' life, from 12 to 30, he was committed to growing in wisdom, stature, favor with God, and favor with men. And to me... Um, I look at that model of leadership. Um, Jesus, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, commits 30 years of his life to, to learning and to growing. And what we see in Jesus' life is that he would go into the temple and he would sit at the feet of those in that day that had spiritual authority. But also, if you look at the structure of government, it was those that had authority in the marketplace in cultural matters. And so I, I want to say to you today that City Church um, really wants to um, begin today a relationship with the Urban League. And we want, um, you know, we really want to sit at the feet of those in authority uh, when it, as it relates to these matters and say, uh, we want to listen, we want to learn, we want to be a part of solutions. Um, and and so today, you know, our church, we are City Church Chicago. Um, you know, we are a city church, an urban church. What are some things we can do? Because our church, we're already um, a part of some of the protests and marches. But, yes. you know, we, you know, we know that that is not enough. Yes. We know that we need to learn more. We need to grow. But what are some things practically that we need to begin uh, to think about in terms of practical steps or practical legislation that we can start, um, you know, um, advocating for? Well, I, I think that that's an excellent question and, and an opportunity and, and so evident of your heart for God's people. And so one of the first things I think you can do is, is look at the opportunity to advocate on behalf of police reform at every level of government. There are bills that are currently being considered by Congress that I think it's important to understand and, and support. 
Uh, there are also um, reforms underway at the local level that will be extremely important here in Chicago as we look to engage um, the police force and, and look to improve police community relations. But I always say to people, don't stop there because it's not just about police reform. It really is about racial justice. And um, we are so open and, and appreciative of your willingness to partner with the Urban League. Um, we are working now to support businesses and there are any number of opportunities to mentor. You know, you have members in your congregation who are either in business school or who have successful businesses of their own, and you'd be surprised what a conversation might um, look like and, and how it might benefit someone who is just starting a, a business in the black community. But even beyond that, the supply chain is so important. Who um, a, an established businesses, business uses to provide goods or services to their business because that's how uh, businesses grow and that's how relationships grow. So that's important. Mentoring our students. Uh, we have uh, a healthy student program and so just being able to talk to somebody about wanting to be a lawyer or a doctor or an accountant or uh, wanting to own your own construction business. That's another way to volunteer. And then we always, although I don't know that we'll do it this year, but we'll do it in some way, have a back to school, a large back to school giveaway. So being able to have more hands who will support the um, ability to give school supplies to students, they'll still need the supplies even if they're uh, going to school virtually because that's an important aspect of it and um, and giving away masks or hand sanitizers we were informed last week that we're going to be receiving 2,000 masks we're going to need some folks to help give those away in a socially uh, responsible and distancing way because we know that we need to wear our mask uh, when we are in fact um, in the public and, and, and going about our businesses. So those are some ways that we would welcome a partnership. I think that um, the interaction is so important for people to learn and know each other because, you know, at the end of the day, um, our ability to transform and transcend um, the racial divide that we have has to do with familiarity. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got your call, I said, absolutely, yes, because I know you, right? But I, I probably would have said yes anyway, but it's an easier yes for all of us, for people that we know. And the only way that we will know folks is if we open ourselves up to different people and to folks who may not look like we do. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. Could you just share with us, I'm going to have you pray for me and for our church uh, to end the session. But before we do that, what are ways that our church family can pray for you and the leadership, um, you know, the leadership role that you have with the, with the Urban League? Well, certainly I, I would appreciate prayer for my family. Um, you know, I'm away from home a lot because of my service, not so much now. And that's been one of the treats, quite frankly, of, of sheltering in place because I've cooked more. I've spent more time with my husband and, and my mom, who we take care of in my home, and my daughter. But also to pray for the health of the Urban League. We just finished a strategic planning process. And what everybody said was, you know, this is a lot of work. And so it is a lot of work. And we are undertaking a lot because we know that the work has to be done. And then I would just pray for unity in the community. And it sounds trite, I know it rhymes, but I think it's so important. And I think that if we all just ascribe to some of the biblical principles that we've learned since we were children, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, love the Lord 
thy God with all your heart. Those things matter, and, and, you know, they really do have an impact on the way that we interact with each other. So uh, if you would just pray for those things, that would be tremendous for us. Well, you can count on our prayers. And would you, would you take a moment just to pray uh, for, for me, my wife, and for our church community? Because we, we want to be a part of the solution um, in this time. And, and um, we, we are thankful for the fight that you're in. And we want you to know that you're not alone and that there's faith communities that are in this with you. City Church is just one of many. And, um, but also we, we value the work that you do as an advocate. I preached a message recently on Jesus, you know, our, our advocate. And I really believe that you are doing the work of ministry as you advocate um, in your role uh, and in your, in your job. And I'd like for you to pray for us because I feel like we need to do more advocacy um, as a church um, in this time, um, especially in this time. So I, I value you, your time, your leadership, but also your anointing that's on your life. So we want some of that anointing today. Would you just pray for me and pray for us? Lord, we come this day to say thank you. We thank you for what you have done in our lives individually. We thank you for how you have blessed us collectively. Lord, we thank you for your servant, a servant that is after your own heart, Pastor Kent Muncy. We thank you for his wife, for his children, for his family, God. We thank you for his parents who we know to be godly people, Lord. But Lord, we also thank you for each of the individuals who serve this city church family with him, God. We thank you for them as individuals and for their families. We thank you for the heart that you have given him and each and every one of them to serve you and your people, God, and how that has transcended these walls of this church into the city and how they motivate the individuals that they serve and their families every week to do more for you. Lord, we pray that as we come into a challenging time as a city, as a people, as an organization, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us patience, that you would give us the courage to do those things that are consistent with your word and that are consistent with the way that you would have us go. Lord, we trust you. We love you. We know that you love us and we know that you have equipped us for such a time as this. Lord, we ask that you would have us to be everything that you need for your people. And Lord, we claim victory in advance because we know that you will be with us, ahead of us, every step of the way and we'll be so careful to give you all of the praise because we know you are so worthy of the glory. All of these things we pray and claim and celebrate in the name of your son and our savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, City Church, for uh, joining us in this conversation. It's really just an introduction um, to the Urban League and Karen Freeman Wilson. I wanna encourage you to follow her on social media um, and let's continue to support her and the Urban League in prayer as they continue to lead. Uh, God bless you and uh, you have a great Sunday. Thank you for taking time today to be with us here at City Church Chicago. I'd like to take a moment right now and ask if you would like to invite Jesus Christ into your life to be your Lord and your Savior. Today, you can be forgiven of your sins. Today, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. 
Today, you can secure your place in God's family for all of eternity. If that's you today, I would just like for you right where you are, just to boldly lift one hand as an expression of faith and surrender to Jesus. You're not lifting your hand for me, but rather you're lifting your hand for you, saying, Jesus, I believe in you and I'm surrendering my life to you. If that's you today, right where you are, would you just close your eyes with me and repeat these words. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Free me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me to new life. My future is secure. I am a child of God. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, or the first time in a long time, I want to celebrate with you. And I want to let you know that all of heaven is celebrating. And I want to encourage you to share with someone uh, about uh, what's happened in your life today. Also, I want to encourage you to reach out to us here at City Church, to one of our online hosts, maybe to a friend or someone that you know here at the church. We also want to make sure you have everything that you need on this journey of faith. Thanks again for being with us today at City Church Chicago. God bless you. Hi church, my name is Joshua Dumani and I have the privilege of encouraging you in your tithes and offerings. You know, today I had an experience where I remember the importance of obedience. I had a homeless guy come up to me and request money. And in that moment, my brain decided to judge, my brain decided to condemn, my brain decided to figure out why he needed the money. But I remember just to be obedient to what God is asking me to do in that moment. And I'm so happy that I go to a church where our congregation is obedient. We're obedient in a season where it may not make sense to give. We're obedient in a season where it may not be logical to give but we still see your faithfulness week in and week out. And we wanna thank you for that obedience of stewarding your finances in a way to be faithful towards City Church. So as you prepare your tithes and offerings, I want to pray for it. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for blessing us so that we can bless others. We call this offering blessed and we lift it up to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.